Entrepreneurship education is a human right. A simple statement, maybe even provocative, but one we simply can't afford to ignore with the future that awaits us. The average human would think of themselves as a good person. Not that I'm calling any of you average, of course. But what if I told you that we are denying young children this fundamental right? I'm going to tell you how we're doing this and what we can do differently so that in future we can look at ourselves and the younger generation guilt-free. So let me tell you a story about 2008, the year the financial crisis was wreaking havoc with businesses worldwide. One of them being my um, then husband's technology business. During that year, both his business and our marriage unraveled and he struggled with a depression, leaving him unable and unwilling to work. We had just bought a house on the basis of two salaries and suddenly I was the only person employed. And then one day, a clash in values with the managing director of the company where I worked led me to walk out with no job in hand, no opportunities, no hope. Everything suddenly resembled this VUCA world that I'd heard so much about, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. At 35, I had to start over in a world that held no answers. So what did I do? I became an entrepreneur. What gave me the impetus to start? So I'd like to say that I created some um, disruptive technology in my garage, but no, that wasn't it. I was just desperate. I needed to find meaning but I had no idea where or how to start. The story of Garrett Morgan is an interesting one. Nicknamed the Black Thomas Edison, he was born to um, parents who were former Southern slaves in the US in 1877. And as is the case with most ex-slaves, um, his family was confined to a life of poverty. So Garrett, along with 10 uh, of his siblings, were put to work on the fields at the age of five. He attended a one-room black-only school um, only up to primary level because there was no high school to go to. So at 14, Garrett became a handyman and he used his earnings to hire a tutor to enrich his education. At 18, with only 10 cents to his name and very few resources, he created his first invention, a belt fastener. Over the years, through various experiments, failed and otherwise, he created um, a few entrepreneurial ventures in sectors as diverse as a hair products business and a sewing machine repair store. His entrepreneurial streak, though, led him to huge successes in the safety sector with traffic lights and innovating on fire safety hoods. So what I want to focus in on, on these two stories, is how we both dealt with our versions of the VUCA world. On the one hand, a top student in school and university with three degrees in hand at the time, and many years of work experience. On the other, a child with little formal education, but with a hunger for answers. For all my education and resources, I had not learned how to think entrepreneurially. And I was of the generation and community where the norm was to go to school, get good grades, go to university, work, and then make your way up the corporate ladder. It took a year of chaos at 35 to make me comfortable with uncertainty, to unlearn and relearn, and to find a new way of engaging with the world. You see, I, like most of you, I would assume, 
had learned how to interact with subject matter in a specific way, with a sage on the stage, memorizing facts, and knowing that to every question, there was a right answer and a wrong one. And you needed to get to the right answer with a set formula in place. My I entire identity was tied into not failing to get to that right answer and in that one right way. Garrett, on the other hand, was not boxed in his thinking by the methods of a formal school education. His need and drive to find solutions to the problems he saw led him to innovate and imagine in different ways, in ways that I had not been able to. In 1987, the US Army War College coined this concept of VUCA to describe the world that was a consequence of the Cold War. Since 2019, the coronavirus crisis has made this VUCA world real for us, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So it begs the question, what have we done differently since 1987 to prepare for this VUCA world that many experts predicted was coming? Did we teach our children differently? Did we provide them with tools to make them more resilient? Did we encourage them to play, to experiment, to try and fail and try again, and to find opportunity in the midst of chaos? I would venture to say we have not. It is estimated that 85% of the jobs that our learners today will be doing in 2030 have not yet been invented. While there is some critique of that percentage, what can't be disputed is the fact that our world of work is undergoing massive and unprecedented change, resulting from automation and artificial intelligence. While it is true that the jobs created by these um, disruptions will exceed those that are lost, it is not happening quickly enough. There is much to be done. We know that Africa will have the largest workforce, bigger than China or India, by 2035. By current numbers, a third of that will not be productively engaged or have access to the economy. The political instability, security risks, mass migration, and poverty of 300 million African youth who are unemployed is unimaginable, and women suffer the harshest brunt of all these challenges. So to recap, we have a VUCA future that awaits us, so some would argue is here already. We have a significantly changing world of work and nature of job. We have the largest workforce in the world in just 15 years, and rampant unemployment. And our continent still has some of the highest levels of poverty and inequality in the world. Obviously, our set formulas from the past are not working, or maybe not working quickly enough. And as has been recently said, we are preparing young people for a world that no longer exists. So what needs to be done differently? As entrepreneurship has grown in visibility and coolness in the last few years, it has been marketed as the panacea for all our socioeconomic ills. My money, though, is on developing not just entrepreneurs, who I strongly believe in, but generations of entrepreneurial thinkers, democratizing this new mindset with dynamic young people who will have a different lens on the world. As the world changes and, and disruptions grow and jobs are lost, it will be the entrepreneurial mind that will seek new and innovative ways, pivoting to find new avenues of growth and un unlocking value in different environments, not just in business, but in nonprofits, governments, associations, and um, academia, amongst others. And so, 
to like a contagion, it will spread. As professor and noted author John Spencer said, not every student will be an entrepreneur, but they will all someday need to think like one. So this mindset is needed to address the challenges faced by communities, countries, and continents. It is required and, and builds competitive advantage. It creates economic access for ourselves and others, and it empowers us with personal agency to respond to a chaotic world, and that is why it is a human right. Like air, water, food, shelter, it is a basic need for young people to survive and thrive in a new world. So what does this entrepreneurship education look like? In my experience, um, these words are used synonymously with learning how to run a business. In schools, it loosely translates into a market day. But entrepreneurship education is much more than that. In a study conducted by the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation with 1,200 startup and established entrepreneurs, it was found that there were 14 key mental attributes and competencies they share. These range from a growth mindset to opportunity recognition and assessment, um, problem solving, action orientation, adaptability, resilience, among others. These competencies need to be used to identify and nurture entrepreneurial thinking. That's the mindset piece, the inspiration, the mental agility. Then comes a process to uncover a problem or opportunity that you care about, that you want to solve. And only after that comes the solution, uh, comes the uh, a viable, feasible, sustainable solution and a venture that backs it up. And you will learn how to register and run that business. You first have to learn how to imagine and innovate before you can implement. So how does one democratize entrepreneurship education? I have three key insights here. Firstly, we need to treat it with the urgency it deserves, as a mission, a movement for change. As the Chinese wisdom goes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Secondly, we need to invest in identifying and developing entrepreneurial potential in young people over the long term. This is not a quick fix. Entrepreneurship education needs to enter the mainstream schooling and tertiary environment, and it needs to become a cross-cutting thread uh, in teaching and learning. The third part is about democratization being an act that creates accessibility for all. So our children everywhere, in cities, townships, um, small towns, rural areas, need to be uh, given access to this kind of education through fun, practical, and relatable activities. Entrepreneurship education will be the great equalizer. The emphasis needs to be on nurturing a hunger for exploration, for problem solving and opportunity finding, rather than creating mental straitjackets. Problem solving, you see, is like gym for the brain. And the more that you train it, like with any other muscle, the more efficient it will become, the quicker, the better it will be able to adapt and respond. And thirdly, we need to create a culture of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking in our schools, in our offices, and in our homes. We need to put the spotlight on entrepreneurial change makers as role models. We need to hear their stories and embrace failure so that risk is demystified and is embraced rather than scorned at. We have worked with two young leaders um, and, and they are just amazing, impressive entrepreneurs. Deneo and Daniel 
were awarded scholarships um, to do their university study, and, and through their work in the scholarship, they received entrepreneurship education, training, and support. This is where they learned that entrepreneurship can be used for the common good. It sparked interest in them, and they found a mutual um, interest in wanting to advance the African biotech sector. So they came together to create an entrepreneurial venture that focuses on genomics and diagnostics. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, these young entrepreneurs knew that they wanted to contribute to South Africa's response. And they developed locally produced rapid uh, testing kits. We want to create millions of Deneos, Daniels, and Garrett's. And it is up to us as the adults of the day parents, teachers, and concerned citizens to create the tipping point for this change. Imagine the different world we could create if we were intentional about ensuring that every child, every African child, as early as five years old, were given access, along with their other basic rights, to entrepreneurship education. They would be unafraid to enter that workforce of 2035 because they would be equipped well. They would be dreamers, opportunity seekers, critical thinkers, curious, agile, and resilient. That entrepreneurial spirit that we admire in Steve Jobs, Richard Maponya, Basitsana Kumalo, and Rapalang Rabana would not be the exception. And when these young people are faced with a year of chaos, as I was, or another 2020, they would be armed and confident to forge ahead in new and different ways. The alternative is a future that looks much the same as the present, except with deeper fractures, an even larger population, and an even more perilous climate. As the saying goes, nothing changes if nothing changes. If we ignore the risks and the urgency and we continue on the same trajectory, we are denying, we are refusing our children the fundamental right to be best prepared for a future that we, as the adults of today, and all the adults that came before us created, and that they now need to survive and hopefully thrive within. Can we live with having denied them that right? Thank you very much.